pray amen. Okay, let's get in the text. Let's get into it here. So uh, just continuing on with just such profound truth. So let's look at, at, at chapter three, verse one. I'm just going to highlight some things. Feel free to interrupt or to ask a question. Uh, we first highlight here, a. Uh, this is kind of a conjunction here for this reason. And um, the reason kind of comes back to the previous context. And so there's debate on what's referring to. What I would say is it's, it's essentially going back to Ephesians 1, 15 to 2 to 2, 22. This is Paul's proclamation. Right, so we've been looking at particular knowledge with reference to God, correct? And so Paul is saying it's because of this proclamation, right? For this reason, I, Paul, now there's, de so there's debate here, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds. I'm using ESV. There is debate on how you would translate this. We'll just leave it like this, but um, you could also say, for this reason, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It's like an implied, it's an implied to be. So, correct, you could say, I'll just use a Tagalog example, pagod ako, right? Or, would you say, mapagod ako, mapagod ako, I am tired. Is that correct? Is that, is that correct if I say that? Yeah, so in the same way, it's just, it's just saying, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. And so you could say literally, I, Paul, prisoner of Christ. But it is appropriate if you're using English to, 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 to include the, the am, the to be, okay? And so for this reason, for this proclamation, Paul is a prisoner of Christ, okay? So Paul is the one who's writing. This is the, this is the actor that's, right, that's, that's discussing right now. And so what's, what I find so interesting is that it says that Paul is a, Paul is a prisoner of Christ Jesus, okay? Now, this is considered a prison epistle, and so Paul is most likely in prison. So what do you find so interesting about, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus? What kind of jumps out at you? It's like, ah, that's interesting. If, he's, if he was in prison, where, who is really, who is he a prisoner of? This is a reference to Paul's imprisonment, okay? So Paul is in prison, most likely in Rome. He's writing from Rome. So Paul says, I am, I am a prisoner. I'm a, pri I'm a prisoner because of you Gentiles. Yeah. <laughs> For you. <laughs> but wouldn't we be expecting this to Christ, be a, a Rome, a Rome, right? A Rome. <laughs> I'm a prisoner of Rome. But he says he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Do you Christ see Jesus. that kind of, it's, it's a tongue in cheek there a little bit. You see that? What I would say, what? This is my interpretation, okay? I could be wrong. What I'm trying to get at is that Paul is in prison of Rome. It would make more sense to say, I am a prisoner of Rome on behalf of you Gentiles, right? Because he's proclaiming the gospel. But he says, I am a prisoner of Christ. And I think here that, that he is recognizing the sovereignty of Christ. That is that, that he's in prison ultimately because Christ, everything's under Christ's feet. We saw that in chapter one, right? Christ is the Lord of the universe. And so at the end of the day, Paul's imprisonment is not attributed to Rome. It's attributed to Christ. And so ultimately, he is a prisoner of Christ by Christ's will. And so this is part of God's plan. Now, maybe you don't see that. I hope, I hope maybe you would consider that. What does that speak, though, to Paul's understanding when he's in this difficult situation, recognizing that it's really from the hand of God? Let's take a moment. That Christ, that Christ is under, his, uh, he is under the control of Christ in yeah. all situations, in all the situations. Really good. Excellent. Okay. I, I really like that word, that, that's, the, that's the word control. Christ is controlling his situation. And so he accepts it. And that's hard for us. Anyone who's been in a hard situation, if you haven't questioned Christ, then you're not really a human. <laughs> Everyone who's in a Mahira situation, you're in a very difficult situation. Our, our, we, we question Christ. And so it's for, it's on behalf of... In connection with that theme, would, can we connect that to what 
Jesus said in somewhere in, was it in Acts that this man will suffer for my sake? There's a connection. Is that connected? There, that, yeah. There's a connection. Yeah. Is that yeah, connected? Because, Is that connected? Yeah. Yes, because, because that precedes all of this. And so it wasn't that Christ merely looked down. It's not that Christ merely looked down in the future and said, I see that he's going to suffer. He's like, this man will suffer. It was, it was suffer, Christ, yeah. or, Christ ordained plan that Paul would suffer for his name's sake. Yeah, it's, sake. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And, but, but that also makes sense. Maybe when you see in verse 13, when he tells them, don't feel discouraged at my suffering. Verse 13, don't yeah, feel discouraged yeah. at my suffering. Because he knows it's from the hand of God. It's from the hand of God. Yeah, at first I did not understand why, why he was saying that in verse 13. I, I was looking, where is the connection in that for this reason, for my sake, for this one? I, 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 could, not, I could not see the connection. So it is here in, in verse 1. The connection is in verse 1. This prisoner of Christ. That's why he's suffering. Yeah. That's why and he's yeah, saying, that's why he's suffering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... And Dubai, we would be if 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 there was a if let's say let's say, God forbid, someone persecuted Pastor Henry or, or or someone from TBC, like let's say the the government took them and put them in prison. Dubai, TBC or Lord's Harvest, you would be so sad. You would be so sad that your leader was in prison, and you would be so stressed and discouraged. People maybe would leave the church. Paul saying, "Don't worry about it. This is I am not a prisoner." Of the local government, I am a prisoner of Christ. Christ is in control here. Excellent. Let's move on here. The qualification here, the condition here is this. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace. That was given to me. So, so looking at here, God's grace, you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace. That was given to me. And so we could write this positively. God gave this stewardship to me. And the stewardship, the specific stewardship that is being referred to is God's grace. Now, elsewhere, Paul will say he's a minister of the gospel in, 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 in 2 Corinthians, elsewhere, even in, uh, in, in Romans 1, he'll talk about that he has been given this ministry of the gospel. And so what I want us to see here is that even though he's using God's grace, in, in this regard, we can substitute gospel here because God's grace is revealed in the gospel. And so when, when you're trying to define what is this grace, now, of course, we would want to define God's grace in Ephesians 1. 3 to 14, in 1, 15 to 2, 22. This is the, the specific content of God's grace. But we could say, the big, the big idea of, three, one, of 1, 3 to 14, Diba, the big idea here was God's plan of redemption. So there's a, what I'm trying to get at is there's a very close overlap between the gospel and, and God's plan of redemption. Now, in a very technical sense, the gospel is very specific. It, it's, it's, it's a part of redemption, okay? So we don't want to minimize the gospel in a very technical sense. But in a broad sense, we can substitute the two, okay? And so Paul has been given this stewardship of God's grace. And something else I want to highlight here is that a stewardship is that the big idea for stewardship is this. Is this apply? This refers to is that Paul is accountable. We want to use the word accountable. And specifically concerning the management of content and uh, proclamation. This concerns the gospel. So what am I saying here? Deba, a stewardship, a stewardship you do not own. It's not your message. He is, he, is, he is a steward. He's managing someone else's affairs. In this context, it is God's grace, or we could say the gospel. And so here, what I want to stress, because by way of application, this applies to each one of us. Paul, as a steward, is, a, is accountable for the management of content, or what, what is being stated, the what. And then the proclamation is the dissemination of it, the giving of it out. 
So sometimes people will just focus on the proclamation. They say, sometimes people just focus on the proclamation. We got to get the message out. But then it's like, oh, people don't like the message. Let's just Let's just bend it a little. Let's let's massage it. A little. Let's make it more palatable. Do we really have to include the part about God's wrath? It's very my hero. Let's just you know. Let's just talk about God's love. Do you see this? So then, all of a sudden, people are great at proclaiming the message, but then they're changing the content by omission. God is just a God of love. And so here, when we talk about stewardship, there's there's really two fundamental aspects: management of the content, what is being stated. And then number two, proclamation. Paul says in, the, to, in Ephesians, going back to our, 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 our class in redefining leadership, a biblical theology for shepherd leadership. I'm sorry, I was struggling there. Shepherd leading, all right? In Acts 20, Paul says that I did not shrink back from proclaiming to the Ephesians, Acts 20, the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. And so we as leaders have a duty to, to manage the whole and complete content. And so we should not be taking this lightly. It's a very serious, it's very serious uh, telling God. So th the word uh, oikonomion really comes from the word for house and the word for law. You're right that this refers to the church, um, Sonny, but the, 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 the image, I appreciate you bringing up the, the imagery that's going on here, is this idea of manage, ma literally managing a house. And so, so we can say, so this is how looking at law and house, you can imagine, we do need to be careful with word etymology, but there is this idea of managing a house. That's the, that's the, the, the physical image that's going on here. Um, you're right. So, so what Sonny's saying is it's connected with the church, and that's true, because the, the, the previous context the image of the church is a building or a house, the, the, the dwelling place of God, right? So there is this, there is, it's a very, it's a very uh, rich meaning of the word. And, and it really comes back down, it comes back to this and this accountability that a steward is accountable for his owner's household. So imagine entrusting your entire house, your entire state of affairs to, to a particular person. Is that kind of where you're going with that, Sonny, with, with, the, with the idea of, of, of refer referencing the church, Sonny? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, uh, great, great point, Sonny. I appreciate that, that, that observation. Very, very, uh, ex I did not have that in my notes, so I'm going to add that to the handout. So uh, excellent job, Sonny. Thank you for, for, for drawing our attention. Uh, verse three, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. So again, just to draw attention here, this is referring back to, this is a comparison, and it's referring back to Ephesians 1 to 2, and look at this, the mystery, the mystery is not the subject, it's the object, so, so that's where I was going here, so the, the, the action is here, so it was made known to me, and so to be made known, you could also use the word reveal, the mystery was revealed to me by revelation and so the means here is a special revelation from christ and so what was one of the fundamental structures in biblical theology we had promise fulfillment what was another one we had we had promise fulfillment type anti-type or what was another image from biblical theology? revelation Yes, yes. So we had, so this was, in, we, we used the example in, in Romans. Romans is the same thing. Romans, Romans 1 and also 16, the, the beginning and the end of Romans. We have mystery, revelation. And so we highlighted in biblical theology that when, when this mystery is revealed, it's not a new, it's not something new that was never planned before. And it's not something different. It's merely, it was always there as a reality. It just wasn't revealed. It was hidden. It was hidden, yes. But it was always present. So when my daughter hides, we play hide and go seek. Until she reveals or I find her, she's there. She's always been there. It's just it hasn't yet been revealed. And so this is so important because people will want to talk about this mystery as being a new plan of God. Things didn't work out and God had to change his plan. 
And we want to say, no, this was always planned. It just wasn't revealed. And so this is why we're, we talk about um, revelation and redemption. Or we can say act and word and act. And so we, 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 we've seen that. When you look at biblical theology, there's an inseparable relationship between the two. God has to act. And he also has to reveal to us how he's acted so that we might believe. And so going back to Voss's discussion, he discussed all this and a lot of it, if you recall, you know, we were like, oh, it's not really, you know, he doesn't really explain. He just presupposes. This would be a primary, another primary text. We actually didn't go here. Maybe in future times when we teach biblical theology, we will actually go to um, Ephesians chapter three. I'm actually thinking about adding that to the curriculum for biblical theology, because here we're seeing it clearly. This mystery that was hidden is now revealed. And so he says here, when you read this, so this is a time reference. This is a time reference here. When you read this, you can, now I don't like this word perceive only because I don't like this word perceive because it kind of misses the connection that we can see in Revelation uh, in Ephesians chapter one. So that you can, I prefer the word can understand. You can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So we still haven't gotten yet. The biggest question we have is what is this mystery, right? In this particular context, what is this mystery? We haven't been we're told this, but you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Looking at the word understand and insight, or we could use the word here. Where have we seen this word before? Someone give me where we have seen this word before. Ephesians 1.10. I just read verses 9 and 10 because I think you're referring to verse 9. Making, I am no, making known to us the mystery of his will. Making known to us the mystery of his will. And so this idea of knowing. So let's write down here Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. And so here, the mystery of his will is that it's a plan in the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things on heaven and things on earth. And so this mystery includes this idea of unifying all things in Christ. That was never, although we should have been anticipating it, it was not publicly declared in the Old Testament, okay? The correct going back to, to, to undo the curse of Adam, it would have to be through one man that the curse would be, have to be undone. But no one, it wasn't explicitly stated, and so people would have missed it, okay? So that's one aspect. Where, where else can we have this understanding? And uh, where's another reference to this? Anyone else have another reference? What about Ephesians 1, 17 and 18? Uh, Ephesians 1, 17, 18, that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ might give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know. Okay, and so Paul's prayer is that they would know some things, and then Paul is going to give the things that they need to know. And so Paul is giving it to them uh, in writing. And his prayer, I, we talked about this, isn't so much he's giving it to them. So it's not an issue of, it's not so much an issue of what is it they need to know because Paul is giving it to them. It's, it's an issue of receiving it. That's the critical thing. So here, that's why they use the word precede, so that you can perceive my insight. So this idea here is that of receiving the truth. It's one thing to speak the truth. And you say, do you have it? And you can say, yeah, I, I understand. But are you receiving it? <laughs> are you receiving what I'm telling you? You know, so you can be telling someone something, but they're not actually receiving it. So I think this is what Paul is trying to get at. This, this, uh, so that you can receive, you can understand, accept my insight. Because it is something that has been revealed. And so this, this, this is coming back to here. Let's, let's be clear here. This is coming back to the revelation was given by revelation to him. So he is giving a new revelation in the sense that it wasn't given before, but it is it was always there. But it's, some, it's, 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 it's a form of knowledge that's now being publicly declared. Okay? And so look at this. The, the description of this, number one. 
Description number one, it ha was not made known. So, so th this is very specific here. It's not a new plan. People will talk about a different plan. It's not a different plan. It has just not yet been revealed. It was not made known to the sons of men in another generation. So I'm going to rewrite this. Looking at actor action object, God did not make it known. Revelation. God did not make it known to the sons of men in other generations. Positively. Now it has been revealed. Time. Same question. Go ahead. Go ahead. So this this also goes to say that even with the prophets, this was not revealed to them. Or yeah. they, were there prophets who had seen this kind of uh, what you call it? Uh, they have seen it in the future. Uh, they have seen it ahead of time that this will happen. Yeah. No. Great question. So what we want to say is it's like it's like Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has the vision, but he doesn't have the revelation. <laughs> he doesn't have the, the mystery revealed. He just has, I'm, he just has the, the dream or the vision. He doesn't have the revelation. He doesn't have the, the mystery. So here, what, what we want to say, because first Peter, first Peter talks about this. Uh, that can be, that could, that's, that's part two. It's part two of the little theology, maybe next year. But, but right. The, the prophets had the vision. They were given the visions. Even in the blessing of Abraham, they had the vision. They had the prophecy from God. They just didn't yet have the precise mystery revealed. That's the key. That is the key. Does that make sense, Ray? And so it is now revealed to his apostles and prophets. Now, we talked about in chapter 2, the, the, the prophets were the Old Testament prophets. Here, I do think that this is probably... This is probably New Testament prophets in the church. And so, of course, you're going to say, you're going to say, well, Tim, well, what about, it has to be New Testament prophets in chapter two. This would be the strongest case to say that. And, and maybe that, maybe it is. But looking at foundation, I, I just, you know, I, I think that, that from, from a history of redemption, from contextual, I think that apostles and prophets who, with the cornerstone of Christ, it makes better sense in chapter two to see that as Old Testament prophets and apostles. And then here we could say this would be New Testament. This would be New Testament apostles and then also New Testament prophets. Because there were some prophets in the New Testament that were revealing. That was a prophetic gift. And we're going to see that in chapter four. So I, I, do, I do think that this is fair um, to see them as both New Testament apostles and prophets. And maybe you're saying you're being inconsistent with chapter two. I would say I'm not. But, it, but it, it would be something debated, okay? So we could just agree and disagree, or maybe you'd come to the dark side and join me. <laughs> don't, don't, so then, you're good question. Yeah. So do, do, do you agree that at this point in time, in the new, there are still prophets, or is it just during this period? Yeah, so, so for sure, before the closing of Revelation, there is the, the gift of prophecy. The, the, pro, the Spirit is speaking through prophets because... God has not yet closed Revelation. The explanation of what has happened in Christ is still being revealed. And so, Sigurado, there is a New Testament gift of prophecy. The question is, after the revelation is completed with the apostles, does that gift continue on into the, the present? That's the question. And so what I would say is that that gifting ends with the apostles and ends in the first century. Um, because otherwise... You would have to say that, you, from a logical perspective, I would say I don't see how you can say that the the, the scripture is closed. So definitely, those who claim as prophets right now, these are basically just assuming that they are prophets. Yeah, it's really it's really my hearing to God, but I would say that if logically, if you're going to say that you're prophet, you're a prophet at at this level, you would have to also say that scripture is still open. I just think the two are go hand in hand. If, if you're going to say that, if you're going to say that, you know, no, we're not, we're not prophets like giving new scripture. We're just, you know, maybe speaking the word of God. Then you're changing the definition of, of which is fine because by, by analogy, we are all prophets, right? If, if we're just saying, declaring the word of God, in one sense, all of us are prophets, Diba. I can proclaim the word of God and not in, in a true 
calling sense, but in an application sense, I am fulfilling by in application, you know, by analogy, I am fulfilling the prophetic role. If I proclaim the word of God, and if that, so, if I'm just preaching, that's why they'll t- some of the books for preaching will be the prophetic manual, right? So, in, in one sense, we can all be prophets, but if you're talking in the technical sense of God is giving a special revelation, and you're to give that to the people, that's the the technical definition of of a, of a prophet. I just, I just, it's 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 very it's very difficult. It's very difficult to to not say that scripture is closed you'd have i would say you'd have to say yeah well scripture is open-ended because god's still giving us new prophecy and if god isn't giving us new prophecy then why do you have to be called a prophet in that in that in that technical sense it just to me it just doesn't fit the the, the, the two go the two go hand in hand but this is a secondary issue because it's the scripture is not explicit so this is this is an area where we can agree to disagree and as long as we're not saying the, that that a person who is calling himself a prophet is giving new revelation, then it's it's a it's a point of, of disagreement in in house. If if he's saying I'm getting new revelation from God, that's supplementary to the scripture, uh that's very difficult. Because here, to be clear, this here, let's be clear here. That's the thing that there are times I say we hear preachers who say that uh, God just revealed this to me. Yeah, God just impressed this to me. So, would, would that be too assumptive for them to say that? No. So let's be let's be clear here. In this context here, the apostles and prophets are giving new revelation concerning the history of redemption. It's new. Without it, Scripture is deficient. Okay. So I'm being very technical here. It has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. So, so without this revelation to these apostles and prophets, scripture is incomplete, okay? So, so just from, from a, for a point of order, if you're saying that this specific function here continues after the apostles, you'd have to say that using this as an as a illustration that Scripture is still incomplete because this is very technical. It's new revelation that's for, that's filling up the, the act of redemption. Now, if we say, no, okay, it's complete, we can still speak that the Spirit of God is in us and speaking to us. And so not as it pertains to new revelation with concerning salvation, the history of redemption, because so coming back up here, these are inseparable. So what I'm referring to is Prophecy concerning revelation as it explains redemption is complete. Now, if you're looking at specific specific contextual issues like um, um, not related to revelation and redemption, then of course the Spirit of God is still working today. He's still revealing things to us, but not at this level. Does that does that make sense? So so even I will I will even ask for God to reveal what should I do? Reveal it to me. And so that's why I'm saying we can speak of prophecy in an analogical, in, in, not at this level, if that makes sense. That's why when people are saying though, I am I am a prophet of God, I've been given this new special revelation, you know, and it concerns salvation or what the church should do. Again, with reference to the whole counsel of God that's very that's really that's really delicado that's red flag now <laughs> yeah it's a red flag yeah so Dave you're saying that when when we hear somebody says God spoke to me God revealed this to me God says to me uh we should not immediately believe yeah. because uh many times we hear from preachers God spoke to me God said to yeah. me God said this to me something like that we yeah. do this we do that and, and that's why what I'll typically, I will say is I feel the Lord calling us to do this. And that's because now you're, you, you kind of, because, so, so let's be clear here. What speaks to us in our minds? So you have, you, we still have, let's just talk. I've shared this before. Number one, we have, we have our flesh speaks to us. The world speaks to us. The spirit speaks to us. The word of God speaks to us. Now, many times these are almost the same, okay? And then we also can have uh, Satan and demons. They can't possess us, 
But I do believe that they can oppress. They can speak to our spirit. I, I believe that. We should believe that. When someone says God spoke to me and it's very strong, that could be, but it also could be the flesh. I've had people say that it's God's will for me to divorce my wife. I've been committing adultery. I love this woman. I believe the Lord is calling me to marry this other woman. It's like, I know God didn't tell you to do that, brother, <laughs> because, of, because God has explicitly revealed things. So, so this is why, this is why, what is the only, when we look at, when we look at who speaks, this is the only, this is the foundation. So that's why John will say, test the spirits. The Bereans were to inspect with the word of God. And so if a pastor were to say, I believe the Lord is calling us to do this, and, and it's in line with all of scripture, and it's specifically contextual, then it, yeah, perhaps God is calling him to do that. And so we should trust him. But if he's saying, Let, we need to do this, and it's explicitly against scripture, Cigarado, it's something else, something else. If it's a leader and, and he has been praying and seeking, there's other ways that, that we can confirm this. So when someone says, I have this word from God on like what we should do, counsel. So with, with, the, with the elders, scripture, conscience. And so, so these, yeah, go ahead. These are, these are safeguards. Go ahead. Oh, reading this from a cessationist standpoint, these verses are not a fresh revelation, right? So they are. They are. That's what I'm trying to say. These are. It's a new revelation that has not. That, that's why I'm saying that. So this was not made known. This was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. So this is a new revelation that has never been publicly revealed by a prophet or an apostle or even Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has revealed it to Paul. So that's why I'm saying like, this is big. This is new revelation. So when people talk about, does that make sense, Mark? So that's really strong telling God. And so that's why when we get to the, to the, to Ephesians, that's why when we get to Ephesians, Ephesians four, and you have apostles and prophets, my, my perspective is that this is, comes to an end in the first century, and those gifts, these are gifts here, Ephesians 4, these are gifts. I think it's, yeah, Ephesians 4, 9 to 17. These gifts always benefit the church because we have the New Testament revelation, but they've been done away with. And so people who still want to see that gift continuing have to wrestle with because the claim here is that these apostles and prophets, they are receiving the revelation. It's a, I mean, this is, this is new revelation. So to say that that gifting is still going on into the present, I just, I don't see how you can't say that it doesn't include scripture. And then if you're saying it doesn't include scripture, fundamentally that prophetic office has changed because you're no longer getting this new revelation about the mystery. Does that make sense, Mark? Yeah. This, this puts a stamp really on especially what the Catholics are doing, like revelation from the Fatima and other yeah. married revelation because that clearly opposes what we, this verse tells us. No, excellent, oh. Ray. So that what, what the Catholic Church is saying is the, the leadership, there's revelation leadership, the Pope, and then you have, you have church authority, and then you have scripture. And so in many ways, this is, this, is, this is giving new revelation. And so this passage of scripture at least implies that it's done away with. Otherwise, you have to say that, okay? Um, and so this is why, this is why, this is the Catholic, Catholic. So this is why, we have here, Protestants are sola, scriptura. We're sunny. We're sunny. I like yeah, that. there it is. Come on. <laughs> We're bringing it in. The whole shebang. All right. So that's, this, this, this really comes into Pentecostal 
debates, the charismatic gifts, and then also with the Catholic theology. So you're getting the whole, you're getting the, you're getting the whole nine. You're getting the whole nine in Ephesians. So <laughs> capstone, capstone, Henry, capstone. Come on. All right. So yeah, so Paul is the last one who's made an apostle, but the one probably who died last is John. John, 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 John died I mean, last. Yeah. What I mean, uh, there were 12 apostles. Then Judas, uh, when Judas died, another apostle was uh, was uh, was chosen in replacement of Judas, and mm. Paul was the last of the 13. Excellent. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so the apostles here is there are no more apostles after Paul. Okay. So the prophets here are first they should be qualified. The qualification of the prophet is they should be an apostle. So there's debate there, and there's other, there's like other people, there were other prophets. If you look in, if you look in Acts, there were other prophets outside of the apostles. I do think the apostles, because even in scripture, Divad Jude, Jude is not an apostle, right? Jude is not an apostle. And so depending on who you, de who you define as, as, as Hebrews, who the authors of Hebrews, so you could have other prophets that are giving new revelation from the spirit, by the power of the spirit. So I do think prophets should be a different category. I think that's very fair. Apostles speak to revelation and authority. Revelation and authority. And that's why the Catholic Church wants to see that authority continue in Peter to new popes. So I think you really are, are kind of seeing historically how the Catholic Church got this this. The Catholic Church got the um, the Church authority. They're doing it through the apostles and through Peter. Peter is now conferring on his apostolic leadership to, to future to future leaders. We we, we we're actually going to have a class later in Cloud Seminary on the gifts. Okay, so that would be a whole class. So so what so what cessationists and continuationists believe is cessationists mean that all the sign gifts. Have, been, have ended in the first century, whereas a continuation says the sign gifts continue on. Okay? So think of continuation, it's continuing. Cessation, it's come to an end. Okay? So at least here, we would all have to be cessationists at this level. <laughs> because no one is giving new, new scripture. Okay? So this passage would explicitly at least say, okay, you, you, we have to at least acknowledge that prophecy at this level, apostles giving revelation at this level, these signs, it's, it's ended. So at least in this context, we would give a point to the cessationists. There's other places that we can discuss for sure. Next, when we get to chapter four, we'll have to discuss that again. But I think at this point here, we should all be cessationists at this level. Anything outside of this is really unbiblical. Now we can discuss maybe the talking and speaking in tongues and healing, a, a mediating a, a smaller continuationist perspective. But if you're saying that there are prophets today, there are apostles today that are giving new revelation at the level of scripture, that's really, that's heretical. That's outside the, the, the confines. So <clears throat> we should all be a cessationist at this level. Go ahead, someone wants to say. In, how about for those who interpret prophecies, like especially as they read the Will that fall under pro prophetic gift or something? Yeah, so that would be a prophetic gift, and that would be under a continuationist. Okay, they would say it's still ongoing. And I would say that you could debate that. That can be a debate for another time. The, pro the prophetic gift at this level, we all have to be cessationists at this level. The word of God is not open at this level. Let's look here now at specifically at um, this mystery. And this will get to more of the answers that we're, we're talking, discussing. This mystery is that the Gentiles are, so let's highlight this here. The mystery is that Gentiles are, look at this now, fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers. So the word, the word that, 
I don't really like these translations. I think that they're missing the 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 big idea here. What I have when you look at the when you look at the Greek word, I try not to bring up Greek a lot, but when you look at the Greek word, it's like it's literally co-air. It's co-air, it's it's co, it's co-body. <laughs> it's co-body. That's literally what the Greek word is, co-body. So the, the, the idea of that is of co members. So if you can imagine in, 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 in Tagalog, that prefix, like uh, you have kaibigan, right? This word ka, that, that is associates close proximity equal, right? You have kaibigan, you have other words added. Um, what is it? Do you also have for, um, for neighbor? It's like, it's that same, it's that same prefix. And that's kind of what's going on here. Again, uh, down here, we would have, I want to say here, co-sharer. So they're co-heirs, co-body, co-body members, co-sharer. So who's, who are the Gentiles sharing this with? You. Ha! <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> who is the co, who is the co-heir? Jew. And look what they're co-heirs to. They are co-heirs to the promise. What is the promise? Gentiles. This promise is the promise of Abraham. That's the promise. And it's in Christ Jesus through the gospel. All right. So remember, look here. I always do this when I'm studying. Christ is Messiah. So let me read a parallel passage for you. Let me bring it up on the screen so there's no debate here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3 in verse 20. So look at, let's, let's begin in verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither free or slave. There is no female or male. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now look at this. Everyone would say amen to this. I hope everyone could say amen to verse 29. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. <laughs> this should settle the debate. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. So what's being declared here is not only uh, Christ equals Abraham's, or we could say Israel, body of Christ, church. You see how that works? So if you're Christ, if Christ is the head and we're the body, that's the church. This is the fulfillment, Abraham, Israel. So I'm going to give you the nail in the coffin, the nail in the coffin here. Let's go down to, to the conclusion of chapter four. Now you are brothers like Isaac, our children of promise. We are as real as we can be sons and daughters of Abraham. You are <laughs> brothers like Isaac. Sonny, you're my brother. David, brother. You're my brother too. <laughs> I hope that you know that, that would settle it for all of us. It, it's debated, like you're talking on the break. It's really debated. And um, I really want to say that we need to extend grace to, to those who don't hold to this. I think mo most, if not, I think most dispensationalists would agree to this by application, but they'd say you're a spiritual brother, you're not a physical brother. And you know, but that kind of misses the point here. The, the whole point here is that in the same way that you are a brother to Isaac, you are children of the promise. It just doesn't, it's, it's a hard read. And, and this is why the Jews really probably hated Paul so much because he was equating Jews and Gentiles together. That's why they hated him so much. So um, let's go on here. Let's finish this. this, this uh, so brothers and sisters, the big history of, go ahead, question. Tim, Tim, uh, before yeah. we go, before we leave this one, 
Why is this called the mystery? The one that you enumerated, one, two, three. Why is this called the mystery? Is this from the point of view of the Jews or from the point of view of everybody? From everyone. No one had anticipated that the gen. Although when you read the Old Testament, you're like, that makes perfect sense, right? Because okay. because even in 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 Jesus in, in uh, Jesus's lineage, right? Rahab, she's a Gentile and she is his mother. Ruth is the is the grandmother, great 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 great, great grandmother. So so it's there, it's it's there in the Old Testament, but it wasn't publicly declared. If that makes sense, it wasn't publicly okay. declared. And so Paul is publicly declaring that Gentiles are co-heirs. That's in, that's offensive. If you're a Jew, you are ticked off. Like how dare you? This is my <laughs> promise. This is my promise. How that's dare right, you say right. we're in the same body? Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm asking if this is only as regards from the point of the Jew because they don't like the Gentiles. Yeah, that's why they want to kill Paul. They were so angry. 100%. So angry. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's, it's, it also it's, goes with the Gentiles, you know? like for example, like what the Samaritan woman. Yeah. It's always been there. It's always been there, but Paul... But, 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 but Paul was just, he was the agitator. He was sticking it to them. He was sticking it to them. He was, and they were so angry. And that's why the Judaizers were, they were so angry with the Judaizers because the Judaizers were saying that, oh, you're just second class. You got to take circumcision. You have to do all these things if you're going to be, receive the promise. And Paul was like, no, all that matters is faith. That's it. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, oh, what's the difference of a Judaizer and a proselyting Jew? Yeah, so a Judaizer was someone that really was against, they, uh, I guess, so, I mean, a process, they're pretty much the same. It depends on how you use it. They're, they're pretty much the same. Prior to the church, a proselytizing Jew, uh, you could use it in a more positive sense. Judaizers were really in the church, and they were anti-gospel. They were just pretty much, the church is no different than the Mosaic Covenant. It's, it's all the same. We still need to maintain distinction. Gentiles are still second class, like in the temple. Keep them over there. They're second class. Keep them in the outer gate. They cannot go inside. So that, so yeah, that would. In one sense, they're the same. In another sense, prior to, a, 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 it, it could be, it could be more positive. Yeah. So the, the mystery uh, theme, is, the way I understand it, is now finally the the revelation of the mystery is that both Gentiles and Jews will be one. There will be no more boundaries. There will be no separation. Yeah. Discrimination. Yeah. In the new heavens and the new earth. And now. And now. They're, the, and they're now. both sons and, I know, from, based on the promise, right? Yeah. They're, they're, we're both sons and daughters of the promise. We're both sons and daughters of the promise. So that's the reason why, uh, like, like what you have explained before, that the, the purpose of Christ coming is to make a, you know, make a new man, because you yeah. know, sense of the no, sense of no, that's also no. It's because it's bigger than just it includes uh -huh. Jew and Gentile, but it's bigger. It's going back to creation, new creation. So you're that's excellent point, and that was what I was trying to highlight. It's more than just the reconciliation is Jew and Gentile, but it's bigger than that, and that's mm -hmm. why like people people who don't want to see. Like, so I'll give an example, and I could be mistaken, but someone like an NT, right, they just want to see it in the context of, of Israel and Israel's story. It's bigger than Israel's story. And that's why even the covenant of grace is bigger than the, the covenant of grace extends beyond Abraham to all the way back to Adam. That's why there's, that's why, that's why even here, just to, to really highlight here, what we, what I would say um, is that this is probably Although explicitly referring to the promise of Abraham, it's it, the, the, the biggest the biggest idea here would be uh, this covenant, the promise of, of grace. Because what is it that because the promise in Christ Jesus, okay, of course it includes Abraham, it includes Abraham promise, it includes uh, the Davidic promise for kingdom, it includes the new covenant. And we'd also say it has to include the promise to eat. So what, what comprehensive promise that we can include all of us? The covenant of grace. And grace is really accented throughout Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, and Romans. It's all, grace is the fundamental category. That's why they call it the covenant of grace. 
So if you're going to point to one promise, of course, of course, the promise isn't here, but, but these are all interrelated. Everyone agrees with that. These are all interrelated here. All right. So, so then, uh, uh, Tim, yeah. is it, would it be correct to say that the, the main reason the Jews are against Christianity is the sharing of this promise to Abraham? The sharing of the promise and they reject Jesus as their Messiah. Yeah, that, you're hitting the nail on the head. Oh boy. They, they, they don't want to share their promise with the Gentiles. And fundamentally, the issue is Christ. And remember here, so looking at the history of Revelation, Iba, the first proclamation of the gospel is in Ta'if. Right? So this is why these are all interrelated. These are all interrelated. And so I hope you're getting your biblical theology, uh, your, 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 your money's worth for biblical theology, because this is really, this is it right here. This is, the, this is bringing together, because here you have new covenant, you have Davidic kingdom, right? You have inheritance, you have Abraham's promise, and then you also have the promise to eat. Yeah. This is the reference of what, what Vos says, redemptive revelation yeah so no this is literally we're just we're just using the boss his his framework which is biblical so we're just we're we're, we're seeing it in the text yeah it's late we got to move we got to fly here so we're going to go through this pretty quick I, this is really the climax this i would say is the climax one of the climaxes in ephesians so important let's go on here verse number seven of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to, to me by the working of his power. So notice here, grace does not extend just into salvation, but also into equipping. Do you see that here? So, so what Paul is describing here is he is describing himself as a minister. So this is his ministry here. But it's given as a gift. It's given as a gift from God by God's grace. And this is restated here. And look at the means. So it's in accordance with God's grace. So this is, we could say even here, source one, uh, reason one, reason one, and then reason two. So God, God, God's great power towards us, raising Christ from the dead uniting us with Christ, bringing that, giving us life, right? Reconciling us, man, the new man, right? And now here we have the example of, of God's power in the church. So look here. God's power is at work in Paul's ministry. And so what's encouraging to us is that as we're going to be given gifts as well, a uh, teacher, evangelist and a gospel proclaimer evangelist teacher and also preacher or shepherd shepherd the three other gifts later in ephesians 4 and then of course other spiritual gifts in corinthians in romans god's power is at work in the church through these spiritual gifts and so even in our sanctification and in our ministry it is pervasive of grace so even people that say, okay, God saves us by grace. Now you got to, you got to work really hard in your sanctification. Yes. Paul says I worked harder than everyone else, but it was not I that did it. It was God's power working in me. And so I want to say, yes, we need to exercise faith. Yes. We need to carry out our ministry as we need to work hard at it. But as we do recognize it is God's gift of grace in our lives and it's only by his working power behind the scenes so that no one will boast. <laughs> so that no one will boast. And look at Paul's humility. You can tell someone's heart. Look at this humility. When someone is talking about how good they are, you know they're full of pride. I've done this and this and this, and I'm here to da 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 and you need to do this and this and this because I've done this, this, this. Look at what Paul says. I am the very least of all the saints. Anyone who is looking for power, trying to do a power grab in the church is not going to say, I'm the least of the church members. I'm the most humblest of the church members. No, no one's going to say that. Paul keeps, Paul does not take credit. Look at this restatement. Restatement here again. Restates 
Paul is giving all the credit to God. He is not taking any credit for any of his work. Paul doesn't say, I did this, I did this, I did this. He says, the grace given to me, the grace which was given to me by the working of his power, the gift given to me. Paul is giving all glory and honor and praise to the sovereignty and the plan of God. He is not taking credit for himself. And so we as leaders, we must be humble and always pointing our members to, to God's gift. Look at what was given so that Paul can do two things. There's two purposes here. Purpose number one, preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Messiah. That's going to tick the Jews off. Paul is preaching to the Gentiles the wealth. This is inheritance. The inheritance in the Messiah. And number two, He's bringing light to everyone. So look at this. This is the content of the light. The mystery, the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God. The plan of the mystery. This is the content. What is that mystery? Look at this, brothers and sisters. This is another major point here. Big point. Through the church, the wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This is not to say, oh, it's just in the heavenly places. It doesn't apply to those on earth. It applies to those on earth because heaven is higher than earth. So if, if the rulers and authorities, remember, we're going to see in, in Ephesians 6 that behind, we're not wrestling against physical entities. Behind all of the world's power, Ephesians 2, the, behind the world's system is the prince of the power of the air. And so this, to, to, to speak truth, to speak the wisdom of God to the prince of the power of the air, to the, the authorities of the air, is to speak truth. To, to, to political powers here in this earth. But look at how amazing this is. Through us, this is the body of Christ. We are speaking truth, making known God's wisdom and truth to all rulers and authorities. This goes back to, this goes back to Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, when we talked about how God is exercising rule through the church. This is, this is more information on that. This was hidden in time past. No one could have anticipated this. Look at this here. This was according to the eternal purpose, the eternal purpose, the, uh, the eternal purpose that was realized. He realized in Christ Jesus. So this is going back to Ephesians 1, 9 to 10. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10 says, one second here, Ephesians 1, 9 to 10. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. That's it. That's the plan. So we're coming full scale back this is the climax. This is the climax of the theology. And it's going to, it's really going to end right here. Verse 13, and then verses 14, Ephesians 3, 14 to 20 is a prayer, is the, is the final prayer. Ephesians 3, 14 says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family and earth is named. So now he goes into a, a, cli a climactic prayer. So this is the end. This is the end of the knowledge of God, the, the revelation of the knowledge of God. This is the climax here. And this climax is in, in Christ. We have boldness and access. So in Christ, through faith, we have boldness and access to the Father. 
And look at this. Paul is talking about eternal purpose. He's talking about revealing wisdom to, to rulers and authorities that don't want to be ruled. They don't want to have, a, they want to keep their authority. They don't want to be submit. So look at this here, conclusion. Therefore, therefore, I ask, do not be discouraged over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. That makes perfect sense. If their glory is, if their glory is this, that makes sense. I'm suffering because I'm proclaiming God's wisdom, rule, and authority to the physical and, 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 and inferior. I'm proclaiming it. It's your glory. Don't, don't worry about it. This is what God's doing. Look at this. I am proclaiming that you are co-heirs. I am preaching to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, the light to bring everyone. You see that? So, I mean, this is, this is your glory. This is, you are going to be, you are co-partakers with Jews in Christ, in the inheritance. I'm going to read one passage of scripture. I'm going to bring it back up on the screen, and then we'll close on this. Remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope he has called you to, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. And so we see that proclaiming this to the Gentiles, shining light upon them, proclaiming the inscrutable riches of Christ, declaring the places of authority that the wisdom of God, the rule of Christ. This is the big idea. This is the prayer that we would understand and we would receive it. And it's not so much under, part of it is understanding, but part of it is receiving it. And if we really truly receive it, we won't struggle as much with our suffering, as hard as it may be, because we recognize that, that Christ is on the throne and he's ruling now. All authority and power is given to him.